So, fiscal policy is about expenditure and receipts. And you don't really have to be in this class to recognise that the expenditure is higher than the receipts. Just slightly. Just slightly. Add to that just slightly that we are talking billions, right? And in the next line that's going to come on the table, all I've done is taken the expenditure away from the receipts and then copied out the data that I found and lo and behold, it's the same because that is what net borrowing represents. Each month, I get the Public Sector Finance Data Bank. And don't feel jealous. You can probably acquire it too, but it's not the best of reading. And um, I noticed that in September already, <coughs> that there were some slight changes. That had gone up to 549.9. So these figures still change, even though they refer to the financial year from April to March 31. This is a forecasted figure, and it will change. So if you look at a figure like that, what kind of percentage of GDP is it? in 2010-2011, very roughly, 10%? Yeah, it's about a 10%. And what the, the noise is at the moment is all about getting this borrowing down to zero. Okay? That's, what, that's the hope. And the reason they want to do that is because the public sector net borrowing as a percentage of GDP has just been going up and up. Right, that isn't really what's worrying them. What's worrying them is the accumulative position, 10% of each year added on to years and years of borrowing. So when you hear these kind of figures that the national debt takes 120 million pounds a day just to service, the, to pay the interest, the national debt takes 120 million, you, you're not talking about the little tiddly figures I just showed you. You're talking about a national debt that is now, in the UK, I think in Greece it's actually even higher, the national debt is like 70% of one year's income. So that's the percentage of the national debt. in total, and that's the percentage of net borrowing, the annual borrowing. And that's the percentage of the total borrowing over the years that we've been borrowing. And they basically have got to this position now where they say it can't go on kind of thing. What the UK wants, okay, it's the next slide, is a situation where in the future we are actually down at naught uh, the, the reason I quite like this, this chart and the reason I put it in is the black line is, assumes a kind of steady growth rate, 2 or 3%. If you're a little bit higher, you see you get to your position quicker. If it's a little bit lower, just by 1%, even in 2050 you won't be there. I would assume we'll be on the yellow line. But, but they, they've got this thing at the moment. You've got to reduce. They blame the Labour Party in the UK. They spent too much. But basically, all governments have been spending a lot of money a lot of years. The Keynesian policy that you talked about before generated debt. That was the way it worked. You just spend more money than you've got to pump into the economy. If necessary. If necessary. Because one thing I wanted to kind of try to tease out just to start, which you've sensed anyway, is that politics 
always kind of has an implication on the economic uh, standing of the nation. So there will be political kind of manoeuvring which will involve big savings at the moment or big expenditures at another time and that, that will upset the long-term trend. You're not going to have one political party just until 2049, 2050. In fact, I'd be surprised if it lasts for another three years, but we'll see. Monetary policy has gotten to be a little bit more complicated in recent times. So monetary policy is about manipulating funds to achieve a stable inflation rate. That's its primary, primary objective. It also needs to look after the exchange rate. And um, in the near future, it's going to start looking more, I think, again, at banks and the regulation of banks. But um, I don't know how much of this you need. But fiscal policy is organised by the Treasury on behalf of the government. So it's to do with the Treasury and it's reviewed in an annual budget. Monetary policy is organised by the central bank, the Bank of England. I pause then because I assume that its situation is similar in Holland. So what they try to do is imply that the central bank is controlling the interest rate. It's not a political football. So it started off with the Bundesbank, the central bank of Germany, then the federal bank, then Bank of England, and now I hear the Bank of Holland. What's the central bank called? DNB. DNB? DNB. OK, yeah. Dutch National Bank. OK, I didn't pronounce it so well, but it's Dutch National Bank. So the central bank, we are given the impression, controls monetary policy. OK. This is what it has to do. And then it will get a little bit straighter, you see. This is what it has to do. It has to keep inflation, according to the government instruction, the Bank of England has to get a 2% rate of inflation. When it goes 1% above, or 1% below, incidentally, it has to write a letter to the Treasury or to the government explaining that something's happened a bit weird and it won't happen for too long. So th when this was introduced, it was OK. We never went above 3%. I can remember this. This was the first letter that was ever written. Then they wrote another letter there. Well, I don't know what they're doing at the moment. Every month they just go see previous correspondence. Yeah. Well, they, eh? they have yeah, yeah, they just got the standard one. They run it off. As explained last. So, and again, although it came down <coughs> at the beginning of the recession, as you'd expect it to, this imported inflation has pulled us up above the line again. OK, so how do you manipulate inflation rate if you're a central bank? Because if you have inflation, businessmen don't feel happy. Because like I'm asking you to do, read the economy, think ahead. And it's kind of a bit jittery because, I don't know, we invest a 1,000, we get back 1,200, but then inflation's devalued it by... And all of a sudden you're going, I'm not going to bother with the risk, I can't work it out, or... We borrow at this rate, we get a return at this rate, but then the inflation... So because that creates a kind of noise or an instability, so how do you get inflation out of the system? That's the central bank's business. I'll explain it, um, but this is really what happens. <sighs> right, the Bank of England has a base rate, and that base rate means that if banks need to borrow funds from the Bank of England, 
They can push, they can push securities, paper uh, certificates, certificates of deposits, gilt edge securities, whatever. They can push securities, paper assets, in towards the Bank of England. <coughs> And the Bank of England will give them money. And the rate at which that transaction happens is the London interbank overnight rate. So basically, it's how a bank, the official financial institutions, can borrow money from one another. So they deal with each other and go, like, we need some funds, they borrow from each other. So obviously, once you've got that little transaction going on, the rate that these commercial banks lend to their customers is going to be at a higher rate because they need to be able to cover their own borrowing. So it kind of escalates as you go down the line. And what you've got now is a base rate, that's the blue line, and about one and a half percent above that, to take the final point on that table, is the interbank rate, averaged out the three month <coughs> interbank rate. <clears throat> then above that, you've got a mortgage rate. So, what I was looking for is a diagram which goes further and further, <coughs> spreading from the base, the more risky accounts. Right? So, this kind of interbank money is not that risky. I mean, they're financial institutions dealing with institutions. But incidentally, if we did a history of this kind of graph, these rates are widening and widening. So the interbank community are becoming a little less trusting of one another, <coughs> understandably, because they're getting a bit more risky. They're charging more for their funds. That's how it's done. The other thing you hear about that the central bank can do is quantitative easing. Quantitative easing basically means that the Bank of England pumps out billions of pounds. I think it's 200 billion was last time. And they purchase some of their paper assets back. So that reduces the amount of debt, the national debt, which are held in these paper assets by the commercial banks, and pumps out money. And that's meant to pump money into the system. But the value of money will decrease. Right, the value of money can decrease, and also the value of that money doesn't really represent any output. No. So this is a bit of a, they're not sure if this is a good idea or not. And what we're trying to do is, in a way, fine tune the economy. Whether these things work or not, there is some debate. Rose? I was just going to ask you, I was talking about it. Really quick anyway, but yeah, yeah. Um, increasing asset prices would cause the unions to drop. I was hoping that you wouldn't pick up on that. But that inverse relationship between price and yield is going to bug you yeah. throughout this year because valuations really go to town on that yeah. inverse relationship between the price of something and its yield. If you buy a £100 gilt-edge security and you get 3% return on it, and you know you're going to get 3% return on it each year, and in a way property, you might have a fixed return on your initial investment each year because you know your income stream through 10 years. Okay. And then the value of that property or that bond goes up to £200. The price goes up to £200. You still only get £3. There is an inverse relationship between price and yield. But again, the, the, that, this is ba there is a basic um, conceptual thing about that which you need to get your head around. And I know, it. again, it's a bit like... It's not entirely like the negative inflation <laughs> thing, but it doesn't make immediate sense. You've got £100, got a 3% return. So a £100 investment gives you 3% return yield. 
When you buy property, you do find that you invest money and you get a stream of income that's fixed for a number of years. If the price goes up of the asset to £200, say, you still only get the same rental stream. So it could go... £100 would give you £3 yield. £200 would give you £150 yield. So we saw, that, we saw that video, and the official rate, the base rate, affects the market rates, which was demonstrated on the video. That's the, the base rate affects the, the rates that the banks deal with, affects asset prices. So I could actually carry on with this if you want. So as this goes up, asset price relatively may drop. It affects the exchange rate. And then given time, and that's the thing that I wanted to develop, that we also, when you make a change in the economy, it takes time to trigger and filter through. They say it takes 18 months to two years between the base rate move and the inflation effect. And that's been believed for a long time. I'm just looking at the source. I'm not embarrassed about the source, but the idea has been, been hanging around for ages. What you end up getting going forward is that the, nobody actually knows, and this is a monetary policy committee type slide. This is the kind of ways the monetary policy committee talk. They reckon in the... November 2010 report that going forward, so this is a forecast, this area, going forward, inflation in 2012 could be a little bit below naught or a little bit above four and a half. There's a slightly bigger chance that it will be around four and maybe one. But ideally, the colour there is where they want it to be. But there's a one in ten chance of it being there. They kind of got this, this grades of nine out of ten, eight out of ten, seven out of ten, yeah? So they, there's a whole range of possibilities because they can't determine it exactly, but that's the range that they see going forward. So these fan charts, and you get the same for growth, because I thought I'd move to that one instead, which is a, another type of fan chart. But there's quite a few in the presentation that I could have talked about. So this is the ONS data that we talked about this morning, which shows the GDP growth dipping in 2009 by something like 5%, exactly what we kind of calculated. Going forward they'd like to think it's going to get back on track around 2%. That is the forecast. But there is a chance that it could get a 4. There's also a chance that it could bottom a 0. So this is a range of possibilities. And that's the way they talk now, because you could never fine-tune it to be accurate. These are all outcomes of models, or is, is it just guessing? That's such a good question. Just do that one more time. Is it an outcome of models or yeah. guessing? Because that's exactly what we're going to be doing with the data. It's an outcome of data prediction, modelling, but there's also some kind of gut feeling and guessing going on. So when I've given you this data review and I say, look at a set of data and say how you're going to use it, it's still, you still feel a bit odd about doing it because you don't entirely know the other side of it. All you know is the data. But the, for the data to feel healthy and to be usable, you'd have to understand the market a bit as well and have a gut instinct. I wasn't being dismissive then, but I think it's both. It's kind of gut and a very large amount of data in, this, in these cases. <coughs> so the situation is also not improved by these bank losses that keep looming. Because as the bank losses loom, 
it is more difficult to get credit. The economy slows down, as we've seen. There is weaker growth. And the housing market it becomes rather flat and stagnant. Prices definitely don't rise. They may begin to fall. The problem is, and the reason that's put in this, this is the Bank of England diagram again, I know it's a bit pathetic looking, but when property prices fall, the collateral that they have behind all the loans starts looking untenable. So their books don't make up because the property values which back up the loans become Im imbalanced. So going forward, things get, could be difficult. So the idea is that fiscal policy and monetary policy is meant to stabilise things. There's also a small amount of policy that comes directly from the government assembly, which will be objective specific. So in a textbook, these two, fiscal policy and monetary policy, attack all of these things. So if you change the taxes, it affects prices, employment and growth. If you change the interest rate, it attacks inflation, employment, growth, inflation and prices, yeah. If you have some direct policy, it is more <coughs> objective specific. So it might be aimed at just one thing. And it doesn't go through the market like interest rates and tax. Can somebody give me an example of what a direct policy may be? So it comes out of the government assembly and is more objective specific. It's like building regulations, planning regulations, wage legislation. Yeah, so there's other things that the government can do alongside these macro instruments. And the final thing for today is that all of these manoeuvres <coughs> affect the stock of dwellings. So in the UK, in 1979, which is nearly 30 years before the next set of data, isn't it? Only half the people owned and occupied their houses. And hopefully we're getting quite quick on all of this. That's 11 and a half million, 11, yeah, 11.6 million houses. 2.93 million are privately rented. <coughs> Look at that, that's the big thing. There are 6.7 million houses owned by the council. And there isn't even a social sector at that time. And there's something like 21 million total in the UK, this is. All right, that's why my date is always slightly out of date. Because the UK, don't we? The UK includes Northern Ireland, as you know, and we often get data for Great Britain. But to wait for it to include Northern Ireland, you have, don't know why that is, but you have to slow down. OK, so, um, yeah, I'm just making the point that sometimes it's England, sometimes it's England and Wales, sometimes it's Great Britain, sometimes it's UK. And... I wouldn't like to be Dutch doing that, because I, I thought all those places were roughly the same, much like you, but they're actually different groupings. <laughs> do, you, do you know the kind of policies that causes, over a 30-year period, the change from 55% being owner-occupied to 70% being owner-occupied? From 31% being council property rents to Something like 10%. The right to buy. The right to buy council property at reduced prices is a huge reason for that line going down. And right when, when you buy the, your council property, you become an owner-occupier and that line goes up. Altogether, the private sector is responsible for 80%. And altogether... Yeah, about 20% is public sector, which is why I grouped them like that. 
I could show a video which just explains the politics that lay behind that shift. Just 10 minutes. Because I just wanted to kind of play up the political connection between the policy manoeuvres and what's happening in construction. Okay, so we're just going to watch this video clip. But the, it does explain how that shift happened from 1979. Margaret Thatcher was in the, the Prime Minister of the UK. So this is how government policies affect <coughs> housing at the same time as they're affecting the economy. <laughs> 